That's Luke chapter 2 and verse 36. We want to welcome those who are joining us this morning on YouTube. It's great to have you listening and observing our service and hearing the message from God's Word. We also want to welcome those who are listening on Life Radio in the city of Miramichi, New Brunswick, and the surrounding area. My name is Daryl Tozer, and I'm the retired pastor of the Lower Derby United Baptist Church. We are located just outside of the city of Miramichi. And we are enjoying the Christmas season and talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God sent to be the Savior of the world. Next Sunday will be Christmas Sunday, December the 20th. We invite you to be a part of our morning service at 1030. It's a one hour service. And next Sunday night, December the 20th at 630, we'll be having a Christmas candlelight service. A lot of special music and scripture reading as we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only son. So it's good to have you with us today. If you have your Bible, if you're listening at home or wherever, if you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 2 and verse 36. We're going to talk this morning about a secluded senior saint. Not very often we talk about old people, but we're going to talk about old people this morning, okay? Even though I are one of those, <laughs> we're going to talk about a lady this morning who was really up there. Can you believe it? I think she was over 100. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day for the privilege of being in your house for your precious word open up our hearts to what you have to say to us and if there's someone who doesn't know you through the message may they hear the gospel and come to know the lord jesus christ as their own personal savior we pray and ask this in jesus name amen there is a legend that uh, floats around through europe of a russian prince by the name of alexis who lived in a in a palace that was very luxurious and all around the palace, there were really humble hovels of dwellings where poor people lived. The prince always wanted to relate to the poor people. So he would go for walks out around these little uh, huts where people lived. And everybody seemed to respect him and nod in his presence. But he never really made a connection with anybody. Nobody would really come and talk to him and, and confide in him. And, uh, the, the, the Prince Alexis would always go back to his luxurious palace a little bit discouraged that he hadn't really connected with the people. Then one day a different man came and he went among the people. He was kind of rough. He wore poor clothes. He said he was a doctor. He was devoted to helping poor people. He rented a rat infested shack in the area. Didn't pretend to be superior. As a matter of fact, his clothes had, were torn. He ate the plainest of food when he had food to eat. He treated people because he was a doctor, gave them the medicine for free. And before long, uh, he really was connected with the people. The people loved him. And he was able to contribute towards transforming the whole spirit of, the, of where the, the poor people lived. He was instrumental in settling quarrels among them and reconciling enemies and, and helping many people who were sick. What no one ever guessed was this second fellow who was a young doctor was still Prince Alexis. He had given up his throne, he had given up his palace, and he came down and lived among these poor people to help them. When I read that story in the book, it reminded me of the Lord Jesus Christ, because it says in 2 Corinthians, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. I want to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the Christmas season, and it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remind ourselves of who the babe was that was laid in that manger of straw. That babe was both God and man. He reveals to us what God is like. As a matter of fact, Paul said, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ all the fullness of deity dwelt in him. The babe lying in the straw and wrapped in swaddling clothes is the creator. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And I have to say this quickly, that the babe in the manger is the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. When John said later in life, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away uh, the sin of the world. God sent his Son. You know, right from the very beginning, God promised that he would send his Son. Way back in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It says, and, and thou shalt bruise his head, and, and he'll just crush your heel. That's a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Always makes me think of Charles Wesley, who was the author of that Christmas carol, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. People waited for years for the coming of Christ, right from the Garden of Eden. You know, in the Abrahamic covenant, God told Abraham that through your seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. There's another promise. We also know that, that Jacob's last word said that there would be a scepter. There would be a king who would arise out of Judah. We know in the Davidic covenant that God promised that one of David's descendants would rule over the house of Israel forever. And we know in Micah that Jesus was to be born. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah... Uh, that's where Jesus was to be born. We know from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, that a virgin was to conceive and, uh, and that her son was going to be named Emmanuel. Both the Old and the New Testaments talk to us about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that when the book of Malachi ended and before the book of Matthew is written, there's about 433 years there. We call them the silent years because there was no prophet raised up to speak for God. But God didn't forget his promise that he was going to send a savior. And so we want to talk a little bit about the humble birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to zero in about somebody who saw the Lord Jesus Christ as just a very young infant baby. Are you aware of the fact that there were three women involved in the birth of Jesus Christ? Number one, of course, it was the Virgin Mary. You know that uh, the uh, angel Gabriel came and appeared to her and said, you're, you're, you're going to have a child. And we know that it was, uh, the conception was miraculous. Now, we don't know how old Mary was. Matter of fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's only one lady in the Bible whose age is given. Did you know that? And that lady is Sarah. And uh, her age is given in Genesis 23, verse 1, uh, at the time when she was said she was 127. There's, there are no other ages given of the lady. So I don't know, we men maybe are supposed to get the idea, don't ask a lady her age. Uh, maybe, that, maybe that's what it's about. Uh, in, in, in the gospel as recorded by St. Luke, there are 43 references to women. And if you study the Bible and count them, there are 12 widows in the Bible. And by the way, three of the 12 widows that are mentioned in the Bible are in the gospel of, uh, of, of St. Luke. And here's Mary. She's just a young lady. And, and she was blessed. She was blessed above all women. You say, how is she blessed? Because the long and awaited promised Messiah was going to come through her. That's how she was blessed. She was the one who was going to, to bring the baby Jesus into the world. I, I suppose when it was found out that she was pregnant and not married, that she got a lot of ridicule, right? People made fun of her and, and all of that kind of thing. The, the, the second woman associated with Jesus' birth was, was the lady Elizabeth. Do you remember when, uh, when Mary was expecting a child, she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And you remember when she went into Elizabeth's home, by the way, Elizabeth was the wife of Zacharias the priest, right? Matthew Luke chapter one. When, when, when Mary went in to visit Elizabeth, who was also pregnant with John the Baptist, the Bible says that the baby kicked in Elizabeth's womb. Uh, a, a identifying fact that, that even John the Baptist, before he was born, was going to have a ministry relating to the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's, there's the Virgin Mary, there's Elizabeth. And the third lady that I want to talk about this morning is the lady Anna. Uh, I call her a secluded saint. <laughs> you don't know much about her. Nobody knows much about her. There's only three verses in the Bible about Anna. We read them this morning. It's Luke, of course, and it's chapter 2, uh, 38, um, uh, 36, 37, and 38. They're about Anna. Now, let me talk a little bit about this lady, Anna. Let me give you the order of how things happen. The first thing, let's say, let's start with the manger. The baby Jesus is born and he's laid in the manger. And there's angel appear in the sky to the shepherds who were out on the hillside looking after the sheep. And of course, you know that the message was, you go to Bethlehem, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has been born. And the shepherds quickly took off and they, uh, they came with haste and found the babe and Mary, uh, and, uh, and Mary there at the manger. Uh, seven days after Jesus was born, we know nothing for the first seven days, okay? Those are silent days. And on the eighth day, according to God's commandment in Genesis chapter 17, uh, the Lord Jesus was to be circumcised. Now, you know, all males in Israel were to be circumcised. It was a sign of belonging to the nation of Israel. So on the eighth day, Jesus was brought to the temple to be circumcised. And that's when the baby's name was given. Now, in our day, you usually name the baby before you leave the hospital, right? So they, they can put it on the form that has to be sent into the government for vital statistics. But back then, the, the, the male child 
uh, was circumcised on the eighth day and he was named on the eighth day. Now, there's nothing much happens after the eighth day till you get to the 41st day. And on the 41st day, they brought Jesus to the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And it was right after Mary's purification. Now, do we all understand this? That when, that when a lady had a male child, she had to wait 40 days for her purification. If she had a female child, a lady child, a girl, she had to wait 80 days for her purification. So Jesus being a male child, she just had to wait 40 days. And on the 41st day, then, she came to the temple to offer a, a, a sacrifice as prescribed by the Jewish law. Um, we read about it this morning. It could be turtle doves or, or young pigeons if you, were, if you were a very poor family. So when, uh, when Mary and Joseph with her arrived at the temple on the 41st day after Jesus was born, they met a man at the temple. And the man's name was Simeon. And uh, God had told Simeon that, that he wasn't going to die until he seen the Messiah come to Israel. And when Simeon saw Mary and Joseph and the baby, uh, the Spirit of God prompted him that that was the Messiah of Israel. And he took the baby in his hands and, and, and he blessed the Lord. And, and, and he praised the baby. It, it was kind of interesting. Uh, and you know, right in the middle of it, while this guy Simeon is, is, is blessing the baby and, and blessing the Lord and praising the Lord, right in the middle of it, an old woman walks in. I'm not making fun of her. She's old. And we'll talk about her age in just a few minutes. She walks in. Her name is Anna. That's who we want to talk about for a few moments as well. She's not a superstar in the Bible. She's not David or Abraham or St. Paul, you know, or Peter. She's a lesser light. Um, she's one of the little people that nobody knows very much about. William Barclay, a, a theologian from over in England, he said she's one of the quiet in the Lord. And Herbert Lockyer said she's the woman who began the, who was the first Christian missionary. This lady, Anna. Let me talk a little bit about Anna in the time we have this morning. Verse 36, it says, And now there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Can I say about this lady, first of all, this morning, that this lady uh, has an interesting pedigree. Your pedigree is your background. It's, it's who you come from, isn't it? And Anna, Anna is a very interesting name because Anna is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament, Hannah. Does anybody remember Hannah in the Old Testament? Uh, Elkanah's uh, wife. Remember how she went to the temple? She wanted a child and, and uh, God promised her a child and you remember how Samuel was born. So that's Hannah of the Old Testament. This lady, Anna, in the New Testament was very likely named after Hannah in the Old Testament. Old Testament Hebrew would be Hannah. The New Testament Greek would be Anna. So here's a very interesting lady. Uh, it says she was the daughter of Phanuel. That's interesting too because some of you this morning will remember the life of Jacob. And you remember when Jacob wrestled with God? And after he wrestled with God, when he finished, he walked after that with a limp. Remember that story? And it said that that happened at the place Penuel. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that, it seems that, that her names and all of her association is associated with, with religious things. She was, she was Anna, and she came from Penuel, and she was of the tribe of Asher. You know there were 12 tribes in Israel. We know that 10 of the tribes in 721, 722 B.C., were carried into captivity by the Assyrians by a king by the name of Sennacherib. And, uh, and they, uh, uh, the, the ten tribes never returned back to the land of Israel. But we know from history about 22,000 of those people who were carried away to Assyria came back. They wandered back because they wanted to worship in the Jewish temple. And so uh, this lady, uh, Anna, was from the tribe of Asher, Somehow she she came back and she was now worshiping in the. Do you, you get my point? This lady was a lady of great privilege. Uh, her dad is associated with religious things. Her name is associated with another lady in the Old Testament, and and here she is back worshiping in his very. Can I just say this? You say what's the point? The point is we're very privileged. That's the point. You say how come we're very privileged? We're very privileged, friend, because we were raised in a good place. 
We have been exposed to God's truth. We know what God has said. We have a copy of the Bible. Do you know there are places where they are dying to get a copy of God's word? Just last year in Cuba, one of the things we tried to take down, they're so, they're so heavy to take down a lot of Bibles and boxes and, and then to get them through customs. And we, we took down some Bibles. And one church, we were out of way out in the boonies in, 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 in Cuba. We said to the pastor, do your people have Bibles? No, no, they don't have Bibles. So well, we can give you three or four Bibles. He clutched onto those Bibles like he'd never seen one before. He had a Bible, but nobody else even had a Bible. He said, to go, we, you know, we can't, we, they can't give these Bibles out. <laughs> they, they just have them in the church for the use of the people. The Bible is precious. See, see how privileged we are? We can be in church this morning without fear of being interrupted. We've heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know we're sinners. We know Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and was, and was buried and rose again for our justification. We know that if we trust Christ as our Savior, we're on our way to heaven. And we got a Bible that we can learn and hear and grow. And we live in a land of freedom. We're privileged people. Privileged people. Wow. And the Bible says, to whom much is given of him, of him so much be required. So that's her pedigree. Let's talk about her pain. You said, didn't know she had pain. Well, yes, she got pain. Look at it. It says she was of great age and lived with her husband for seven years. And then after that, she was a widow for 84 years. Now, I'm no mathematician. I never had new math at school, okay? So I have to do it the old-fashioned way. I don't know how young she was when she was married. But I'm going to, can I guess? I'm going to say 15. Now, 15 is pretty young to be married. Would you not agree? You're supposed to do that when I asked you if you agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so 15. And she was married for seven years. So now, help me out here. Now, if I get this mixed up, 15 and 7 equals 20. Oh, we're doing good. And then she was a widow for how many years does it say here? 84. So 22 and 84 brings it up to? You were cheating. <laughs> so I figured this lady was probably about 100, over 100 years of age, about 106. You say, why did you talk about her pain? Well, I'm going to tell you why I talk about her pain. Number one, she lost her husband. She was only married seven years. She had no one to fend for her. She could have said to herself as a young woman, maybe in her early 20s, I lost my husband. God, this is not fair. That's how a lot of people react, don't they? When they lose their husband or when a loved one dies of cancer or when there's a tragic accident takes place. God, is, it's always God's fault, isn't it? It's amazing. You were driving the car, but it's still God's fault. Isn't it amazing how, how, how we do that? We live in a polluted world, but it's still God's fault that somebody has cancer. Wow. We, we always blame God. Now, now worse than that, she, she was only married for seven years. She lives as a widow for 84 years. Worse than that, she never had any children. If you didn't have any children in the Holy Land, you had no one to look out for you. Who was going to look out for this woman? Her husband was dead and no kids. There was no one to look out for her. Back in the days of the Bible, if you were, if you were a widow and didn't have any family to look out for, you were in desperate, dire need. That's why St. Paul uh, wrote to Pastor Timothy. You read it for yourself. 1 Timothy chapter 5, the first 16 verses are how to care for widows in the church. Because it was something else to be a, to be a widow. All of that pain. I wonder if she ever got to the, in the black hole. You know what the black hole is? The black hole is depression. A lot of people get in that black hole. I wonder if she ever got to despair. I wonder if she ever got into self-pity. I was reading this week about depression. Listen to this. Nothing is worse than depression when you feel lost and hopeless, when you are trapped and there is no escape. In these moments, my world is dark and cold and all I want to do is sleep or die. With this depression comes loneliness and isolation. How I wish I could go back to the innocent days of childhood when I was worry and carefree. Even the tiniest responsibility feels overwhelming and the smallest obstacle insurmountable. Worse yet, I am certain that there is no one in this world who understands me. That's depression for some people. The trials of life. We looked at, at this lady's Pedigree, her background, her privileges. And, and we looked at this lady's pain. Can I talk to you about this lady's priorities? Look at what it says in the text. 
If you look at verse 37, it says, but she served God. It says, who did not depart from the temple, but served God night and day. Now you say, pastor, that's a little stretch there. Because it says she didn't depart from the temple. I'm sure she had to come and go from the temple. I don't think so. Are you aware that, that many of the Old Testament priests lived on the temple property? They lived in the outer court of the temple, in little, little houses. And likely they had given a spot to this lady to do that. Wow. It says here that she did not depart from the temple. That's perseverance. I looked up the word devout to see what that means. According to Webster, it means devoted to religious thought and exercises. I looked up one of the writers of the Our Daily Bread Devotion book, Bill Crowley, and he said this. He said it refers to consistent priorities. Didn't have any problem getting this lady to church. <laughs> Dare I quote the verse? Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Because that's the way people are going to not get together as time gets close to the Lord's return. Right? This lady had unwearying devotion. Day and night. Wow. Wow. Dr. Warren Wiersbe, the late Dr. Wiersbe, he said, she had a special gift for proclaiming and interpreting God's truth. It says here she was a, she was a prophet, doesn't it? She was a prophet. So when the ladies came to the temple, she's ministering to them and she's explaining God's, God's truth to them. It says she was involved in fasting and prayer. Now that's two interesting things, fasting. Fasting uh, it means that the burden of her heart was so great that she didn't always take time to eat. She devoted herself to to fasting and praying and seeking God's face. This is the kind of a woman that she was. We all know that there are three kinds of people in the world, right? There's natural, there's carnal, and there's spiritual. Natural is this an ordinary uh, unsaved person who hasn't been born again. And, and, and of course, we know that carnal is a person who has made a profession of faith, but who lives still in some ways according to their sinful flesh. And spiritual is a person who is, who is walking close to the Lord and walking in the spirit. And this lady, you'd have to classify her as spiritual. She was, she was sold out, friends. She was, she was sold out. What, what, what a lady we got in front of us here this morning. This Anna. Her pedigree, her pain, her priorities. And I want you to notice her proclamation. <laughs> Look at verse 38. It says, And coming in in the instant, that while, while, uh, <laughs> while, while Simeon is blessing the people, coming in in that instant, she gave thanks to God and spoke of him to those who look for the redemption of Israel. Just as, as she was coming in and, and she saw, can, can you kind of imagine her? She's, she's coming in and she's saying, oh, there's Samuel. He's, he's, he's holding a baby. There's the baby, that's gotta be the baby's mother. Oh, yeah, her husband. And all of a sudden, it comes together. The Spirit of God prompts her. And she's saying to herself, this has got to be the one that Samuel said was going to come, the Messiah of Israel. And guess what she did? It says she praised. Wow. Quite a lady. Quite a lady. She prays, she worships. Can I just ask you this? Are you a worshiper? Look at me for a minute. Are you a worshiper? Well, you say, Mr. Tozer, I'm in a worship service. True, but are you a worshiper? I learned a number of years ago, though I was in church nearly all the time and sometimes about every day, that I wasn't a worshiper. I was there. I was singing the songs, but I wasn't a worshiper. This lady, she praised, she worshiped. Her whole heart welled up with joy and she worshiped God for who he is and who he had just said. And not only that, it says that she worshiped and then it says she proclaimed. Did you notice that she spoke of him? First she gave thanks and then she spoke of him. So, so she was... Uh, she was witnessing. She was prophesying. She was given the good news. By the way, the good news that the Messiah has come is not meant to be a secret. <laughs> and what did she speak of? She spoke of uh, 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 all those who look for the redemption of Jerusalem. 
In other words, redemption, according to uh, Dr. Strauss, is to be set free from the payment, uh, by the payment of a ransom. And, and she was saying, this baby's going to come and he's going to set the Jewish people free. He's going to die for our sins on the cross and be buried and, and rise again. And, and she could tell everybody, this is Christmas. You know, I, I, I like Christmas. I'm not hung up on Christmas trees and lights and all that, but I like that stuff. Uh, you know, Grisa, I, I, I enjoy all that stuff. But I want to tell you, Christmas is the time to talk about Jesus. This is a time of year when people will listen a little bit. And this dear lady at 106 likely stooped over. Maybe her voice was weak. Her hair was gray if she had any. And as soon as she realizes who this baby is, she starts going around the table telling everybody. That's what I want to do this Christmas. I want to tell everybody. Jesus came and he's been born. I don't know if anybody here has heard of J. Wilbur Chapman or not. J. Wilbur Chapman died on Christmas Day, 1918. <laughs> a long time ago. He was a Presbyterian evangelist. He went to a Quaker day school. I don't know if you know anything about the Quakers or not, but the Quakers worshipped in churches that were square. They were very interesting people. And one of the disciples of J. Wilbur Chapman was a fellow by the name of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was an evangelist before Billy Graham. Uh, Wilbur Chapman uh, wrote a song about Jesus, and I love his song. Sometimes we sing it. It goes, living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Written by, by J. Wilbur Chapman. Anna, not many people know about her. Can I say, I like this old gal. She's pretty spunky. She still got, as we say on the mirror machine, she's got, still got some mustard in her bones. She finds out who Jesus is and she worships God for the Savior he has sent and she's going around and telling everybody you know as you get older people cut you a little bit of slack and you can go up to people and say hey it's Christmas isn't it great it's Christmas we are celebrating the fact that God sent a Savior into the world the Lord Jesus Christ came to redeem us, came to die on a cross, paid for our sin, shed his blood, was buried, rose again. He's the Savior. Everyone who trusts in him as their personal Savior will have eternal life. And at the end of life, the glories of heaven. Anna. Let's follow this old gal and tell everybody this Christmas about Jesus. When you have, if you have people in your home, don't just talk about how nice the turkey looks. Talk a little bit about Jesus. People you meet, tell about Jesus. Where you work, the person on the next desk to you, on either side, tell them about Jesus. This is a time to speak about Jesus. Father, Thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ. May some of the excitement of Simeon and Anna get through to us today and into our hearts that we might kind of explode with joy and we might worship you for sending a Savior to redeem us from our sin. And Lord, that we'll not keep it a secret, but we'll take advantage of the season and talk about Jesus. Help us just to go, Lord, from one to the other and be a, a mouthpiece to share about the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there's any listening today who have never trusted Christ as their Savior, that they will acknowledge their need as sinners and come to the cross. Invite the Lord Jesus to come and live in their heart. Bless thy word to each person today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. This is a great song about talking and...